I invite you to open a Bible to Ephesians chapter 3 as we conclude our sermon series going through the first half of Ephesians. And the, the whole theme of these three chapters is all about what we just sung about, right? That, that Jesus loves us. And it's a simple answer and refrain that many of us have known and sung since childhood. And yet the whole point of all of these paragraphs and sentences and words that the Apostle Paul has written is to remind you and me, to remind the church and everybody who would hear these words, the simple truth that Jesus really does love you. And this morning, as he concludes chapter three, that Paul is writing a prayer for the church. He meant to begin it at the verse one in chapter three, and then he got distracted. And now here in verse 14, he's picking it back up and saying, oh yeah, here's my prayer request. And essentially, this is the summary of Paul's prayer request, is that no matter who you are or what you and I might be going through or struggling with, the ups and downs of life through all circumstances, that you and I would believe and trust in that good news that we just sang, which is Jesus loves me. That's, that's his whole prayer request. Now, he does it in three ways. And so if you're into taking notes, here are the three points of Paul's prayer. The first is that he wants Christ to dwell in you, right? He wants Christ to dwell in you. His second prayer request is that you would be strengthened in your faith. So Paul's second prayer is that you and I would be strengthened in our faith or our trust in Jesus. And his third prayer request is that we would comprehend or understand the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. So he wants Christ to dwell in us. He wants us to be strengthened in our faith. And he wants us to comprehend or or understand the extent of God's love in Jesus for us. So as we go through this, these are the three things we're going to look at. So verse 14 of Ephesians 3, as you follow along in your Bible, Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So he's saying who he's praying to. He's, He's praying to the father of all people, right? So this is the beginning of him trying to teach us how expansive God's love for humanity is. Paul defines God as father, and many of us, if you're a Christian, would say, yeah, that's who God is, right? We even say the Lord's Prayer, right? It begins with our father, right? We say it. But what is Paul saying? He is the father of whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He's not just a loving father for the good Christians, right? He's not just the father for the people who love him back and and have it all figured out. No, Paul's saying, no, I'm praying to the God who is the father of everybody. I'm praying to the God who who has a fatherly love for all his children, and those children are every single person in the world, in heaven and on earth. So when Paul begins to make his prayer request, he's reminding us, this is who we're praying to. A father who loves all of his children. And all of his children are people, everybody. Now this is gonna be important for later on. So you gotta remember that part, all right? Fair enough? Everybody gonna remember that later? You promise? All right. Now, the other thing that he says is he says, I bow my knees. Now, most of us would go, yeah, okay. He, he bowed his knees, great. Like, anybody ever bowed your knee, like, kneeled down to pray? Anybody ever done that before, right? Did you think about it, or did you just kind of do it? Because you're like, oh, this is like a humble way to pray, right? Now, the reason Paul mentions this is he's not telling them, this is how you guys got to pray. You got to fold your hands, bow your head, kneel. By the way, the reason we tell people to fold their hands and bow their heads so you don't get distracted during prayer. It's not in your Bible. It's okay to pray that way, all right? But the reason Paul mentions this is because for a Jewish man at that time, they would have never prayed that way on their knees. The most common way for a Jewish man to pray back then, and Paul even mentions this in another of his letters, is they would be standing and they would have their hands raised to heaven and they would be looking up at God. What Paul is saying here is, I'm actually bowing my knees. I'm kneeling in prayer, which is just the opposite of the way he was taught, the opposite of the way 
that everybody that knew Paul would say, that's how you're supposed to pray. The reason he did it is because that's how Gentiles prayed. And he's writing to a bunch of Gentiles. Now, the reason this matters is because Paul is trying to help people understand this, that God that he is praying to is the father of all people, both Jew and Gentile, both the Christian and the non-Christian. And Paul says, no, he's also the God who will heal, hear your prayers, even if you pray like a Gentile, by kneeling. And so what he's doing is he's saying, look, I'm kneeling in prayer for you to show you that God loves every single one of you. That he is a father who will hear your prayers because you are his child. Whether you stand up and you put your hands in the air, which no Lutheran is ever going to do, all right? <laughs> Or if you're like Paul or the Gentiles back then and you kneel down to pray. Does that make sense? See, Paul's trying to teach from the very beginning, this is who I'm praying to. And this is who you're going to pray to. He's a God who loves all of his children. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, he's their father. And whether they're praying standing up with hands raised or they're praying by kneeling down and folding their hands and closing their eyes, he's going to hear their prayers. All right, so he gets into it and he says, this is who I'm praying to. This is who you and I are praying to. And then he gets into his prayer request. He says in verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And in verse 17 is his first prayer request for us. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend, right? So his first prayer request is that Christ would dwell in our hearts. And we think, oh, okay, well, if I believe in Jesus, he's there, right? And one of the most common names for God, especially from Christmas time, is Emmanuel, which means God is with us, right? And I've done surveys at every church I've been to where I just start asking people, what's your favorite name for God? And Emmanuel always wins. You know why? Because everybody likes the reminder of what? God is with us. He's with me. But well, here's Paul's prayer request. He's praying that these things would be true for you and me as the church, that, that Christ would dwell in us. Now, that's not because Paul thinks he's absent, right? Like, if you're a Christian, he's not absent from you. You're like, no, Jesus is with me. What Paul's praying for is that we'd actually be aware of his presence. Because sometimes we forget the good news that God is actually with us. Circumstances get difficult. Things don't go our way. And we wonder, if you've ever asked yourself this question, where is God right now? Or where is God in all of this? Right? It's a common question that we struggle with sometimes. And so Paul's saying, here's my prayer request for you. I want Christ to dwell in your heart. Now here's the Greek word for that. Katakoil, right? And that'll be fun for you to spell later, right? But here's what that word means. It, dwell is just, okay, that's nice. God's with us. That's neat. But it, what it literally means is for someone to come in and take up permanent residence, okay? Which makes the sentence way longer. So we just translate it as dwell. What do we, Paul's prayer request for you and me is that Jesus would come into our hearts and take up permanent residence, meaning he will always be with you. And that because he is always with us, we begin to grow in our faith, we begin to grow in our trust in him, we get to grow into our understanding of just how much he loves us. But we forget sometimes, and that's why Paul's saying, here's my prayer request for you, that Christ would not just hang out with you or be next to you, but to take up permanent residence in your life and in your heart. Meaning wherever you go, whatever you face, whatever ups and downs life throws at you, you would always be able to know for certainty, Jesus is here. He is with me. He has not abandoned me. And so this is Paul's first prayer request for us. And then he goes in, 
2, verse 18, that because Christ dwells in us, he has taken up residence in our heart. We're growing in our love for him and his understanding of his love for us. Verse 18, that we may have strength to comprehend. Now, why do we need strength? Because sometimes we're weak. Anybody ever been tired and you're just kind of worn out? And you're like, I'm done with this mess. Right? I'm done. Like, show of hands. Anybody ever just said, I'm done with that circumstance? I'm done with it. Not dealing with it anymore. And then someone comes along and like, we should revisit it. You're like, get out. We're not. <laughs> no, no. I, I said I was done. We're not talking about it anymore, right? So we all get there on a human level. We have things in our life, whether it's relationships or work struggles or, or internal struggles, where we're just like, I'm done dealing with this. I don't like this anymore. I, I want it to be resolved. I want it to be taken care of. And in those struggles, we become weak. And sometimes in that weakness, Satan works against us to make us question, well, how much does God actually care about me? All right, so I've brought this up before. Most famous Bible verse, John 3, 16. God loves the whole world. Everybody loves that. We sing about it. We just sung about it, and Jesus loves me. All right, all right Jesus loves me. How many of you already knew that hymn and didn't need the words for you, right? And you're just like, I know it. Here's Paul's point of why he's praying for you and I to need to be strengthened. It's because sometimes we're weak in actually believing it's true for us. I've met lots of people and I've struggled with myself where it's like John 3, 16, God loves the whole world, right? And then Satan comes along and we're worn out, we're exhausted, things are not going away and we, we think, except for me, right? Well, like he, he loves those people, of course, they've got it together and things are going well for them or they, they just love the Lord way more than me. So think, and, but for me, we begin to question it. Our, our, our trust in these promises that God loves us, that Christ dwells in us, has taken up residence in our hearts, is with us no matter what, becomes weak. That's why one of the most famous prayers in the Bible is a man telling Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. And so Paul's saying, I know this is the reality of life. By the way, Paul's writing this prayer while he's imprisoned. You don't think like Paul ever wondered, like, hey, I did everything the Lord wanted me to, and now I'm in this terrible situation. I guarantee you, Paul would had a few talks with Jesus about it. And in fact, in Corinthians, he even asked God to take some of his pain and struggles away three times, and three times the Lord says, no. And Paul is like, what? Why would you say no? Don't you love me, Lord? Don't you care? Don't you see what's going on? And so Paul's writing this prayer that you and I as Christians would be strengthened in our belief and in our trust that God loves us, that Christ is with us. Because he knows from firsthand experience, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we become weak. Things happen to us, whether we have internal uh, temptations and addictions or struggles, whether things have gone wrong in our circumstances or things have been done to us, we begin to wonder, where's God? Does he care? Is he actually with me or is he just with all the good people? And Paul is praying, I want you to be strengthened in your trust that Christ is with you. Right? He's the father over everybody, including you. He is the savior of everybody, including you. And he's saying Christ has taken up residence in your heart and in your life. So the second prayer request is, I simply want you to trust that promise. Because sometimes we need encouragement. We need someone else to come along and remind us and say, just so you know, he's still residing with you. He's still dwelling with you. He hasn't given up on you. All right. Because as human beings, we all know, like, sometimes I'm wondering, What's going on, Lord? I've asked multiple times for you to take care of this or take this pain away or take that struggle away. And just like Paul, you, you keep saying no. And Paul's saying, yeah, that's why I'm praying for you and I to be strengthened. And then he gets to the beautiful part of the passage that everybody knows and loves. He says, I want you to have strength, in verse 18, to comprehend with all the saints. So comprehend, understand what everybody else understands and believes. Here's his prayer list. What is the breadth 
and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So what Paul is saying here is, here's what I want you to, here's his third purpose, I want you to understand, I want you to comprehend, I want you to believe and trust in, is how expansive God's love in Christ is for you. This is what we're, he's praying for us to be strengthened is, is okay, Jesus is with me, and now I'm gonna trust that he's with me, and not only that, I'm gonna trust that he has an infinite, perfect love for me. And sometimes, it's hard to believe that. Sometimes it's a struggle to understand what, how do I know that that is true for me, right? And so Paul uses this language, this height and depth and breadth and length. So in your bulletin, you had a handout. I'm sure many of you looked ahead right, and cheated. But go ahead and take it out. Now on one side of it, I wrote for you the dimensions of God's love, and there's this little cross with arrows on it, and we have the words of Paul. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because early church fathers like Origen and Augustine and Arrhenius said that here's what Paul is describing when he's talking about the height and the depth and the breadth and the length or the width, right? Like, he starts using all these words, and it sounds beautiful, right? And you're like, wow, God's love for me is just big, right? It's expansive. And then you're kind of like, well... How do I measure these things? Like, what is he referring to? And so early church fathers like Augustine and Origen and so on, what they taught and their commentaries on this passage is that what Paul is talking about when he's using these dimensions is the dimensions of the cross. That when we are struggling and wondering, well, just how much does God love me? Like, just, just how far does his love for me actually go? They're saying what Paul is saying here is, the answer is you look at the cross and that becomes all the evidence you need of just how much does God love me? How far does his love for me go? When I look at the cross, I see Jesus dying in my place, forgiving my sins and redeeming me. And not just from the couple of things you feel bad for, right? Not, not just a few mistakes or that kind of thing, but for everything that is imperfect about you, right? Every sin that is past, present, and future, he's saying, no, no, when you look at the cross, Jesus has paid it in full. There's, there's no more extra sacrifice for you to do. There's no more extra work for you to do to make God love you just a little bit more. In fact, in 1 John, the apostle John says that when Christ died on the cross, he was loving us with a perfect love meaning it's whole, it's complete. There's nothing more to add to it. There's no like extra love God is keeping hidden from you until you get a little bit better. And he, he, he's already done it. And so what Paul is praying is, here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to comprehend of how big God's love for you is in Jesus. And he says, oh, it's about the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And the answer being the cross. That when I look at the cross, I go, oh, there's my answer. That for every imperfection, every mistake, every sin, he has forgiven me and redeemed me and made me his own. And so when we do struggle and we have our weaknesses, we're needing to be strengthened, we need to be encouraged, we need these reminders of what has God done for me and, and how much does God love me, Paul's answer is, well, you look to the cross and you see Jesus and you go, that's the answer to how much does God love me? How far does his love for me go? How big is his love for me? And we just keep going back and back and back to the cross looking at Jesus. And we're trusting the promise that, oh, well, that was a perfect love. That's why he cries out on the cross. It's finished. It's done. There's no more work to be done. There's no more uh, making up for misdeeds to be done. It's simply, no, he has loved you with a perfect love. And so this is Paul's prayer for us. And the word for comprehend, because we think immediately our brains, right? Like, I'm going to understand this. I'm going to be able to answer some uh, questions on a test. I'm going to be able to go to Bible class. I'm going to get all the questions right. And the Greek word here for comprehend is katalambano. And what it means is to actually take hold of or to seize. All right. So Paul is not just saying, 
I want you to know the facts in your brain, right? Like, he's not saying, I need you to be able to draw a cross on a piece of paper. What he's saying is, I want you to take hold of, to not let go, to seize that good news. Which means that when we are weak, when we are struggling and and we're going through hardships in life, what our faith does is it simply clings to the cross and says, this is everything. Right? Other stuff might be going wrong. I am a sinner. I've got guilt and shame. I've made mistakes. I'm not perfect. But here's how I know that I am loved by God as I am. So we simply cling to that cross. We, we, we don't just think about it. But Paul's saying, no, no, you, you seize it. You, you grasp it. You hold on to it and say, this is the evidence that Christ dwells with me. That Jesus loves me and forgives me. Now, Paul is saying here, here's what I want you to know, is who you are in Jesus. Right? Because our weakness is always being attacked by Satan. None of what I just said is good for Satan. He doesn't want you to be like, yeah, I love the Lord and the Lord loves me. I'm his child. He's always working against us, always tempting us. This is why Jesus describes him as a destroyer because he wants to keep you weak. He wants to keep you struggling. So to help you out, to remember these prayer requests on the other side of your handout, I've listed for you prayer reminders or just things that will help us strengthen ourselves of who who you are in Christ. And these are all from Ephesians. And I wrote them down because I know you love me, but I really doubt you remember everything I've said. Okay? So if you read the first three chapters of Ephesians, This is what Paul says about you in Christ, that you're chosen, you're adopted, you're redeemed, you're forgiven, you're given a whole new purpose, you're promised eternal life, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. What Paul is saying is you completely and totally belong to Jesus, and there's nothing Satan can do about it. And so our response, when we are tempted, when we are hurting, when we are struggling, when we are being attacked, is to cling to the cross to seize it, to to lay hold of it, like Paul says, and say, this is all the evidence I need to know that Jesus loves me. This is all the evidence I need to know that I'm chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, given new life and purpose. This is all the evidence I need to know that I am given and guaranteed eternal life and that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, meaning you have no more power over me. You don't get to destroy me. You don't get to win because I have the cross. And so this is Paul's prayer request for you. What I think would be really cool is if we began praying it not just for ourselves, but for each other. You don't have to do it by name. You can do it by name, but you don't have to. Paul didn't do it by name. He just said, I'm praying for the church. And so to make that our prayer request is simply, here's what I want for my brothers and sisters in Christ at our Savior. Right? The same things that Paul has prayed for us, that Christ would dwell in our hearts, that he would take up permanent residence in our lives, that the people sitting in the pews worshiping with me would be strengthened in their faith no matter what circumstances they're going through, and that every one of us would comprehend or take hold of God's perfect love in the cross. That every time we're struggling or going through ups and downs, we'd all encourage each other and say, just keep holding on to the cross. Because that's God's love for you. That's the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of it. That's how you know how much God loves you. Because what Paul is doing, he's not praying it for himself. He's praying it for the church. And so as we receive that good news of Jesus, it'd be really great if we all just said, you know what? That's my prayer for the week. That's my prayer for the month. I'm just going to pray for members in the church to know these truths. And to know at the end of the day, no matter what, Jesus loves me. All right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your expansive love. That every time we are feeling weak or struggling, any time that we are overwhelmed, that we can cling to the cross, knowing that you have loved us with a perfect love, that you have forgiven us and redeemed us and made us your own. And that no matter what comes our way in life, We belong to you for all eternity. 
And Lord, as we rejoice and rest in that good news, may we be like Paul, and may we say those same prayers for all of our brothers and sisters who are our Savior and around the world. In your name we pray. Amen.